How do you think about savings rates in crypto? Introduction. Lending and borrowing cryptos is becoming an increasingly important subsector of the crypto industry. One that may end up shaping how the underlying assets themselves are valued and priced in markets. Until recently, the two mantras in crypto have always been to hold and keep crypto assets in self-custody, not your keys, not your coins. Unsurprisingly, crypto savings accounts where users relinquish control over their assets in exchange for higher interest rates is a controversial topic in the crypto community. On the other hand, since many crypto enthusiasts invest in crypto with a long-term mindset anyhow, the idea of letting assets generate a return, regardless of the price appreciation, of the underlying asset is an appealing one to many. If implemented properly, crypto savings accounts have the potential to draw in new investors while encouraging the movement of crypto capital out of storage and into markets, thereby facilitating adoption and new use cases for crypto. Interest rates are important in financial markets because they fill the gap between people with surplus assets that they cannot use and people who need assets because they have a productive or investment use. By trading the time value of an asset, both parties benefit in a non-zero-sum manner. For blockchain assets, vibrant lending markets are important because borrowing mechanisms are extremely limited, contributing to mispriced assets. Example, scam coins with unfathomable valuations because there's no way to short them. And blockchain assets have a negative yield resulting from storage cost and risk, both on chain both on exchange and off exchange without natural interest rates to offset these costs. In this analysis, I explain what crypto savings accounts are and untangle the different models that exist. And the aim is to provide a framework for investors to make it easier to assess the risk and make informed investment decisions. How do crypto savings accounts work? Crypto savings accounts work in a similar way to normal bank saving accounts. In a nutshell, you lend money to an institution which lends your assets to to borrowers in need of liquidity. However, these loans are relatively secure since the loan providers ask the borrowers to deposit crypto assets themselves as security for the loan. Most providers ask for a loan to value ratio of 50%, meaning that if a borrower wants $1,000, they'll need to deposit $2,000 worth of Bitcoin, for example as security for the loan. Who are these lending providers lending my assets to? Most commonly, these are institutions and individuals that hold crypto in need short-term liquidity but don't want to sell their crypto. Furthermore, they would not be able to receive loans against their crypto assets as easily from traditional lending providers such as banks that are reluctant to handle crypto assets. To give a few examples of the type of companies using crypto back loans, Crypto miners, they need financing to cover their operating expenditures, such as pay employees, electricity costs, etc. Traders, they want to seize arbitrage opportunities and need short-term liquidity to execute profitable trades. Hedge funds, having invested in ICOs or other digital assets and want to leverage your position to pursue more investment opportunities. Crypto exchanges, which need financing for their marginal lending and trading services. Now, how are interest rates determined and why do they differ between providers? Generally speaking, interest rates in a given market are determined by supply and demand. If there's a lot of borrowed demand for a specific asset, interest rates for the asset will naturally go up in order to incentivize more lenders to deposit their asset. Looking at one of the borrower profiles mentioned above, namely, namely traders, Demand for stable coins like USDT would, for example, go up when traders pursue a long-term strategy. To buy crypto with the borrowed USDT and demand for crypto assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum would go up when traders pursue a short strategy. To sell the crypto in reverse later when the asset is cheaper. As such, interest rates for any given asset are a product of the aggregate demand and supply of all borrowers and lenders. Moving on. Different operating models. DeFi versus CFI. Interest rates can vary significantly between providers. One reason why they differ is that the platform where the loans originate from have different operating models. Broadly speaking, there are two types of lenders in the crypto industry. Centralized crypto lenders, CFI, and decentralized lending platforms, DeFi. Centralized crypto lender, centralized crypto lender, or CFI. This is a company that provides crypto lending services 
and is often subject to regulation, identifies its users, and controls its software platform and data. From a consumer perspective, these providers have the advantage of paying out loans in fiat, dollars, euros, etc. due to their banking relationships. Funds are held in custody by the provider, making them somewhat similar to traditional savings accounts. Furthermore, their client base often consists of institutional investors since they are able to offer bespoke deals, often 24-7 customer service and other services that matter to institutional clients. As a result of this significant borrowing demand by institutions, they are able to offer more stable savings rates than DeFi protocols. Now, what are decentralized lending protocols or DeFi? This is permissionless lending protocol. Permissionless lending protocols are systems that allow users to lend and borrow various different digital assets, typically through so-called smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. The smart contracts powering these protocols run without a central authority. They are hosted and executed on the Ethereum big, big blockchain, making them permissionless and censorship resistant. Additionally, these protocols are non-custodial meaning that unlike centralized lending pl platforms, lenders remain, remain in control of their deposit funds at all times. In the Compound and Aave protocol, for example, users receive tokenized representations of their share in the liquidity pool, which they can redeem against the underlying asset at any point. The only caveat to this occurs when all the funds are borrowed in the liquidity, liquidity pool. In this instance, lenders would experience longer waiting times. It's important to understand that DeFi protocols are not companies in the traditional sense. Instead, their governance in development is outsourced to the community through the use of blockchain, through the use of governance tokens. Since DeFi protocols exist entirely on the blockchain in the form of smart contracts, they can be integrated into any front-end application. Example, Compound and Argent, Singo, and Dharma permissionlessly. Also, because protocols are not companies, they cannot offer some specific features involving off-chain contractual obligations such as fiat on and off ramps. However, these features can be built on top of these protocols by the aforementioned front-end applications to make it easier for investors to use them. Now, what are some of the different business models? Pointing out the different demand dynamics between DeFi and CeFi is only part of that explanation. Within CeFi, we have companies like Coinbase offering a mere 0.15 APY on USDC savings, while BlockFi offers a stunning 8.6% APY on their GUSD savings accounts. The reason for the stark difference is that BlockFi generates interest on assets held in interest accounts by lending them to institutional and corporate borrowers, while Coinbase is financing this by pulling from pre-existing revenue streams like trading, treasury management, or investment activity. The question that every investor has to ask himself is whether the offered return is worth the risk. It's obvious that BlockFi's business model to achieve the yield is inherently riskier than Coinbase, but the real question is whether it is 57 times more risky. Let's assume that we put $1,000 in a BlockFi account, yielding $86 after one year. To achieve the same return on Coinbase, we'd have to deposit about $57,000 in our Coinbase account. Now, which is more risky? Given that custodity, custodity is one of the biggest risks, which is similar for both companies, one could argue that depositing $1,000 in BlockFi is actually the less risky. Move here when hunting for a yield. It's important to do your own research and read the fine points. There you'll find more info to better assess the risk. For example, BlockFi client funds are structured to be at the top of the capital stack, senior to BlockFi equity and BlockFi employee capital. This means BlockFi's business and client incentives are aligned and BlockFi would take a loss before any client would. Which rates are higher for DeFi or CeFi? In theory, arbitrage should drive interest rates between DeFi and CeFi platforms to converge. If rates to borrow are cheaper in DeFi, Investors are going to rush to DeFi to get these cheap rates and lend them on CeFi platforms until both rates are in equilibrium. In practice, however, we have seen large differences between the two. Right now, interest rates in the DeFi space are significantly higher than what CeFi, than what CeFi platforms offer because some protocols offer user network tokens in addition to the normal interest to incentivize network participation.
The more users borrow or lend, the more network tokens they earn. This scheme, known as liquidity mining, has led to unusually high activity and interest rates on those protocols. Before that, we saw a long period where interest rates were higher in the CFI space. Centralized financial providers had the general advantage of seeing more demand from big traders and institutional investors because their service is more tailored to what sophisticated traders expect. 24-7 support, custom deals, fiat on and off ramps, etc., and automated protocols, and also automated protocols. It will probably take some time. It will probably take some time until markets become sufficient efficient for interest rates to fully converge and institutional traders to become comfortable with DeFi. We see the first signs of this with CeFi lenders like Naxo servicing cheap capital from DeFi protocols when market conditions are favorable or supplying assets when lending rates are high. When recent rates could remain different, when recent rates could remain different is that consumers come to a conclusion that one business model is significantly riskier than the other. And more on that soon. What are the risks? Like any financial investment, depositing your assets into a crypto savings account comes with risk regardless of whether it's CFI or DeFi. Risk with crypto lenders. Loan defaults. As we mentioned before, the risk of default on the borrower side is limited because lending platforms use over collateralization to reduce credit risk. If the value of the collateral backing a loan falls under a certain threshold, the provider sells off the collateral. However, in the event of a black swan event where the market crashes extremely rapidly and many liquidations happen at the same time, the proceeds of the asset sale could be insufficient to pay back the lender. While this is certainly a possibility, it's important to stress that this has never happened in real life, even when markets crash 50% on a single day. The next is a custodian hack. Probably the biggest, the largest risk factor is the largest risk factor is that the lending company's custodial provider where your assets are stored gets hacked. If someone penetrates one or multiple of the asset lender wallets containing the collateral, loans would not be secured anymore and lenders could lose all their deposits. To offset that risk, many custody providers have insurance policies to pr protect users in cases where they do get hacked. Unfortunately, these often have a ceiling amount, so whether you got reimbursed or not, in the case of a hack depends on the size of the hack. Moreover, if the attack affects all the custody provider clients, such as exchanges, institutions, crypto lenders, etc., and not just one, the insurance amount would certainly not cover all the losses. Bico, for example, one of the most important custody provider ha has a $200 million insurance policy in the case of a hack, but has X amount of assets under management or AUM. Enter transparency. The crypto lending space is fairly unregulated and it's almost impossible for lenders to know what happens with their deposits. It's entirely up to the provider to provide transparency. There are concerns that crypto lenders provide more risky, example, not sufficiently collateralized loans to specific clients. Some crypto lenders also rehypothecate some of the collateral that borrows deposit as security to earn additional money. The, this practice was widely used in 08 and eventually led to the infamous great financial crisis. Now some terms to understand. Insurance policies. Look for providers that have a direct insurance policy in addition to their custodians which protect only their user funds. Proof of reserve. Some crypto lenders such as Unchained Capital give segregated wallet addresses for each user allowing for real-time checks and chain and preventing funds from being rehypothecated. Transparency. Transparent crypto lenders put all the relevant information forward on their site to make it easy for users to find out what matters. And this includes contract terms, the provider license, where the company incorporates insurance policies and other information. Now some risk with DeFi protocols. Smart contract risk. This is the main contributor to counterparty risk in DeFi while DeFi is often referred to as, a tr to as trustless, a user of a DeFi platform must trust the smart contract they are interacting with. A smart contract would could be OPIC to a user who is not tech savvy, tech savvy, which means a user is trusting the contract code in the same way a user trusts the code of a traditional web application. This could potentially be exploited by malicious smart contract developers, although users can protect themselves from this risk 
by only using protocols which have been audited by the community and professional audit firms. The far bigger risk, however, is that the smart contracts get hacked because of, because of a loophole in the cult. This happened in February 2020 when DeFi lending protocol BCX lost $650,000 in an attack. Next one is loan default. As with centralized crypto lenders, over collateralization does not completely remove credit risk. For example, during this year's biggest market crash, the maker protocol lost $4 million of collateral, collateral because liquidators were able to submit $0 bids for Ethereum collateral held in user vaults. In short, the maker protocol relies on a system where users slash liquidators can submit bids to acquire collateral at risk for a small discount relative to the market price. Since this represents a relatively risk-free profit opportunity, these auctions are usually very competitive. However, in this particular case, there were no other bids due to unprecedented Ethereum network congestion and liquidator bots not being set up adequately for this scenario. With no other bidders being around, one participant was able to buy the collateral for virtually nothing. Another factor to take into consideration is the type of assets being used as collateral on a protocol and its respective liquidity. Ether collateral, for instance, is more secure than a liquid ERC-20 token, which can lose value very rapidly during a market sell-off. This is why there's currently a big debate in the maker community over which type of assets can be added as collateral. Protocol peers would like to keep the protocol simply using only Ether, while others want to add new types of assets to attract new investors and increase the addressable market size. Next thing is centralization risk. One of the biggest contributors to centralization risk in DeFi protocols is the use of admin keys. Admin keys allow protocol developers to change different parameters of their smart contract systems like oracles, interest rates, and, potential, and potentially more. Protocol developers' ability to alter these contract parameters allows them to cause financial loss to users either voluntarily or involuntarily. If their users' keys get compromised, there are different measures to mitigate this risk somewhat such as time locks and multi-signature wallets, which, distri which distribute control to a large number of people and introduce time delays, allowing users to move their funds out of the protocol developers' ability to alter these contract par parameters, allowing them to cause financial loss to users either voluntarily or involuntarily if their keys get compromised. There are different measures to mitigate, there are different measures to mitigate this Risk somewhat such as time locks and multi-signature wallets, which dis which distribute control to a larger number of people and introduce time delays, allowing users to move their funds out of the protocol before a change takes effect. In conclusion, I have pointed out that saving rates differ substantially. First, rates can offer significant rates can differ significantly between CFI and DeFi because of the different supply and different and demand triggers and additional incentives in DeFi or liquidity mining to bootstrap liquidity. Also within DeFi or CeFi, interest rates deviate substantially depending on the business model or the risk of the protocol. The main keys here are threefold. First, when comparing rates of CeFi companies, it's important to ask yourself what the real risks are and, rather, and whether the promised return is worth that risk. If you think the main risk lies in custody, then you'd rather deposit small amounts that offer a high return instead of high amounts that offer a lower yet, let ri yet less risky return since you'll face the custody risk in both cases. On the other hand, if you think the main risk is inherent to the business model, example, company lendings, example companies lending out your money to insolvent counterparties or an un under collateralized basis, then you'll, you're better off avoiding C5 lenders altogether. Second, without a widely accepted approach to on-chain reputation or identity, the only method to avoid un unwanted amounts of credit risk in DeFi money market platforms is to use over collateralization. In terms of transparency, the DeFi space is light years ahead of the CeFi space since contract terms are set in stone in the form of code and users can see in real time how much collateral the protocols hold by looking at the blockchain. To get a measure, a smart contract risk looking at things like a protocol's maturity the amount of collateral holds or the amount of audits has been through can be helpful since it shows that the code has been reviewed and trusted and third 
Well, CFI and DeFi, they're all their own pros and cons. Some companies tr try to create the best of both worlds by implementing DeFi elements. Example, full transparency into the ethos of the company. A clear example of this is a proof of reserves, which it could become a standard in CFI as these companies will have to compete more and more with DeFi.